Thank you for having me. My name is Leo Caporal. I'm a, one of the partners at the Carolina Spain Institute. I've been uh, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic for 14 years as a professor of anesthesia and ran uh, clinical research there. And the last 10 years uh, at uh, Wake Forest as a professor, um, also helping with the fellowship program. Uh, the we have a very large research facility. Our research facility has 22 research associates and we run somewhere between 30 and 35 studies. Most of them devices and most of it neuromodulation. So I participated in most of the um, recent uh, large studies and definitely we can talk about it a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, talk about the 10 kilohertz today uh, and give you some details, a little background and then details of what we did more recently. So a little bit about history of uh, Nevro itself. So uh, it was found in 2006 and the, yeah, through the, all the way through 12, they were, there was a small feasibility study in US and there were lots of other um, patent related uh, uh, innovations and uh, eventually culminated in European study. European study was run by several of really close friends and experienced neuromodulators. That includes the um, Jean-Pierre Van Boyten and Adnan al at the Guy St. Thomas Hospital in London and uh, gave a basis to start with the FDA randomized perspective study. Now, somebody in board of Nevro uh, decided that I would be the PI for the study. And I was really, uh, I mean, looking now back retrospectively, uh, this was probably my, my, my dearest, not my, my most favorite study ever. And there, there are a few reasons for it. One is that um, the randomization process was phenomenal. Uh, just absolutely fair because all of us who assembled together like these uh, 15 sites across the country had an experience at the time using various types of uh, stimulators, lots of them using uh, Boston Scientific. Actually, all of us were consultants for Boston Scientific at the time. So when the FDA said, well, you should pick one device, lots of us had experience with Boston Scientific. So we uh, the other arm was Boston Scientific uh, traditional spinal cord stimulation system. And the, um, and the nice thing about a study, and those are really, really honest studies, when you let go other arm to another company, it requires a little, little bravery and a little, you know, and confidence from the sponsor, but uh, that other arm, um, traditional type of spinal cord stimulation was Reprogram in, even in between the <laughs> in between the schedule research appointments because um, because you know Boston Scientific had an uh, army of the reps who uh, were at each of our sites, especially our site. So uh, eventually we published twelve months and twenty four months data, and I'm I'm really pleased that we published in a high impact journals at the time and providing evidence for 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. And on top of it, uh, not only that uh, we provide an evidence, but also uh, the therapy was named by the CMS as superior to traditional spinal cord stimulation. And in addition to, we received number of the awards, I think total of 17 awards for the 24 months data, including paper of the year and the Sam hasn't pushed a word to, to me. Uh, so the, uh, so th this is some chronology of the published data. And what we were able to show is that the improvements in the pain scores was much more profound when it comes to the back pain uh, with the uh, vast majority of the patients having more than 50% of the pain relief with 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation compared to traditional the spinal cord stimulation. Keep in mind, these are, these are still up to that time, the best results for traditional spinal cord stimulation. And obviously that relates to improvement in, in a 
anchoring and battery quality and everything else. So again, uh, leg pain, similar improvements in a leg pain were much better using 10 kilohertz than traditional type of spinal cord stimulation. So, so superiority was proven uh, in this uh, uh, paresthesia free therapy and relatively simple uh, trialing and implantation with anatomical placement of the lead was uh, out there and has been out there now for, for five years. A little bit more about comparing the real world results with the study. Frequently, you will say that the study has rigorous um, inclusion and exclusion criteria and may affect the outcomes uh, in a sense that the uh, it makes it look better. Uh, here you have uh, 1,600 patients, consecutive patients from a number of the sites. Uh, these are high volume implanters across the world. As, as you can see, 78% responder rate com is comparable to what we got in our CINSA study. Even more, um, if you 90% of the patients were satisfied with the therapy, 32% of the patients reduced medication intake and uh, explant rate 3.7 that includes infections and only 1.2% due to loss of efficacy is a pretty, pretty good outcomes when it comes to spinal cord stimulation. And actually just recently published this issue of regional anesthesia pain medicine al Qaizi article on 1,100 patients showed that the that the, uh, the factor that decreases risk for explant when it comes across the board on any implanted spinal cord system is using the 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz significantly lower rate of explants than traditional and other types of the spinal cord stimulation. So, so those differences when you compare uh, traditional spinal cord stimulation. And these are some of the data published before, uh, including the, uh, the birth study, the sunburst study. Um, as you can see, improvements in um, traditional and burst uh, spinal cord stimulation go to up to 50% of the patients with more than 50% of the pain relief. Or Nagy Mikhail, who was my boss at the Cleveland Clinic for so many years, he would say 50-50 club. And that's what he always claimed that the 50-50 club, about 50% of the patients with more than 50% of the pain relief was our sort of constant over the last 30 years until 2015 and 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation. And if you compare this to age of 10 or 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation, you can see that the, especially in back pain improvements were profound and long lasting. So, a little bit about that enigma of a thousand hertz stimulation. And it makes all sense that improvements at thousand hertz were comparable only to traditional spinal cord stimulation. We proved that, we published actually a study on thousand hertz. We trialed so many patients and I, and actually we did a switch off to a thousand hertz and published that in regional anesthesia pain medicine two years ago. So my study, David Promizano's study, and even our own, uh, consultant to Boston Scientific, James North, who is my partner here, studies show that uh, modest improvements can be achieved with the 1000 hertz spinal cord stimulation, uh, despite the fact that this is sub-threshold type of the stimulation. Again, patients don't feel it. The outcomes are close to traditional type of the spinal cord stimulation or slightly better. Obviously, does do not compare to 10 kilohertz, and that has all of the basis in in, in, in all basic science, a, a paper that was published in neuroscience, which is highly regarded uh, journal in, uh, in basic science of, of um, uh, neural, especially neural um, modulation or, or any effects of the physiology and effects of the drugs, show that the, um, not only that we can regroup those columns, but we can also take the doors of horn by uh, directly affecting projecting neurons from laminas one and five that in turn affect wide dynamic range neurons. So uh, that other pathway is very important for central sensitization. And that's why 
probably we see this additional effect from 10 kilohertz. So uh, thinking about those patients that uh, may not achieve a high level of pain relief, 60, 70, 80%, and you may want to do something else. So with the new system, uh, the Omnia, that it's now on the market and has been on the market for a while, you can actually do that. You can pair or combine the different types of stimulation and embed it in 10 kilohertz. So you can have 10 kilohertz running in the background and have either traditional above the threshold tingling-based stimulation if the patient likes tingling, or they can go back and forth. And then underneath 10 kilohertz uh, spark or stimulation, or you can combine it with others like burst and others. I have a very few patients. Uh, most of the patients uh, responded nicely to 10 kilohertz, but I mean, this is, a, this is really a nice option to, um, to rescue those who may have lesser than expected improvements in a pain scores uh, uh, with a 10 kilohertz. So, so those are some of the uh, pair waveforms and um, any types of uh, stimulation that can be combined within the same uh, system, uh, engaging uh, possibly more of the other mechanisms. So a little bit about the rescue study. And um, this rescue study was uh, initiated by the patients, believe it or not. So in 2015, when the approval came uh, from the FDA uh, um, and the, we started doing initial implants in regular practice, even before that, I, I had the calls from several patients asking about a new therapy. And one of them was the, and I, I mean, she's still my patient and communicate uh, quite a bit. She was the, uh, and she's still CEO of nonprofit organization that was in, in, uh, in Seattle, Washington. So she got implanted by a colleague of mine, Mike Gofeld, uh, with the Boston Scientific System. Uh, the system was working for about two years and uh, eventually she totally lost the efficacy. Um, she turned off the system for about six months before she came actually to see me. Michael Sender, he said, well, there's a new type of stimulation. The, the, this initial data looking so good. Uh, maybe, maybe Leo can help you. So, so she actually came physically here and it was, we were just uh, uh, finishing study and uh, we were just, uh, just about getting approval. And then eventually she returned back. And what, what I did, we just to the explant of the, of the traditional spinal cord stimulation system and implanted 10 kilohertz. In the same surgery, she went back to Seattle and, um, and she reported back to me. So her pain scores went down from an average of eight to about one or two all the time. Now over the last five years. The second patient was also similar, sent from Nagy Mikhail, my, my ex-boss at the Cleveland Clinic. The, uh, the patient family moved to Raleigh and she moved with her husband. And uh, so she had also failure of the, of the traditional spinal cord stimulation system. Again, uh, 216 contact Boston scientific system that we also replaced and achieved the same result. And then another one was four years turn off system, um, traditional, it was at that time St. Jude system that we also, so, so eventually I, uh, you see the pattern, uh, we, I, I spoke to uh, University of Kansas, the Wood Sayed, and he said, yeah, we did quite a few of those um, uh, rescues using 10 kilohertz. Um, and we achieved uh, similar results and I don't know how, what is the magnitude of this response, but we should look into it. So we did. So we, we got 120 consecutive patients that were switched from traditional spinal cord stimulation to 10 kilohertz in two sites. We got the IRB approval and um, we look at these patients and as you can see demographics, and let me move that screen of mine. I mean, the, the, 
so to, to a little bit more in the detail. So we extracted all of these data, as you can see, in order to uh, uh, make a uh, proper assessment of, of, uh, of the patients that we actually switched from traditional spinal cord stimulation to 10 kilohertz. And then again, as you can see, we were able to identify 120 patient records and then 105 we had the full uh, record that we were able to, uh, to uh, uh, analyze. And uh, those 105 patients had at least one year follow-up. So these are some of the characteristics of these patients. Again, I gotta move the screen a little bit to, I mean, to. So a uh, little bit more female than male median age of about 60 and baseline opioid use was uh, relatively high at about 60 morphine equivalents a day. So median duration of the of previous traditional implant was four years. So if you look at the improvements in the pain scores at one month, um, uh, 12 months and most recent, which is between 22 and 64 months, um, you can see before we switched to uh, 10 kilohertz spinal cord stimulation, their pain scores uh, were just above eight. And improvements were in average profound to a little bit more than three, and they were maintained over uh, over extended time period. Again, the last visit between 22 and 64 months, and looking at the, 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 the uh, traditional type of the stimulation at 12 months, it was quite uh, quite nicely. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 10 kilos uh, stimulation at 12 months, it was quite nicely maintained. So 90% of the patients achieve at least 30% of the pain relief and 85 out of 105, which is 81% uh, of the patients had more than 50% of the pain relief. So, so we were very pleased with the data and you can see in this tornado chart right there that, um, that the, um, uh, most of the patients achieved uh, more than 50% of the pain relief. And every single line that you see this is an individual patient that we, we had in a study. So again, this was followed by decrease of opioid usage. So from about 60 to about 30%, uh, 30 morphine equivalents a day, I thought that was it was a great achievement considering that we were able to half opiates uh, after we uh, after we switched from traditional type of the stimulation to to 10 kilohertz so so most of these patients were considered failures of traditional spark stimulation uh, they were some of them had their system turned off for a couple of years Almost everyone improved, improved clinically. I mentioned 90% of the patients with more than 30% of the pain relief. And then um, I think uh, considering this study and the data that we were able to collect in, in three now large prospective studies, I presented the data on non-surgical back pain just uh, last weekend at the NANS meeting. Um, and then, um, Erika Peterson presented data on uh, peripheral neuropathy in diabetes study. Uh, both of them large, very large randomized prospective trials uh, funded by Nevro. Uh, I think we are looking at a uh, uh, really bright future when it comes to 10 kilohertz uh, spinal cord stimulation. So in addition to simplicity of trialing and implantation, which has a predictable time interval, considering only anatomical placement, uh, safety of the patients because they don't have to be awakened uh, through the surgery and the uh, uh, outcomes that are uh, quite impressive and include the possibility of rescue, traditional spinal cord stimulation using 10 gigahertz. I think uh, this is a therapy that is uh, here to stay. So I will take some questions from you and thank you very much for having me. Good morning, Dr. Caporal. Morning. Good morning. Now, this is Dr. Perez. Let me just uh, open the video and my question. I'm actually working on an insight uh, starting last month and I'm so pleased about your presentation and I see all the excellent outcomes you can get. You know, being uh, someone that actually believes in neurostimulation procedures and 
I done quite a, a pretty good number of cases with the different companies. And the highest you can get is actually 50% of good responders. Sometimes, uh, you know, trying to reduce medications is not easy. So I was just wondering, uh, sort of like a mechanism of action. You, do you think, uh, you know, this, this increased response that you get with Nero is actually related to any central mechanism? You know, you actually mentioned this yes. sensation or something, because that will open up the opportunities for a lot of, uh, you know, chronic pain individuals, not, not for, you know, not for pain disorders, but maybe I'm also treating trigeminal neuralgia in different conditions. So I'm just guessing that at some point, you know, these new applications, these new results, now you open the venues for additional research in this field. What do you think about it? Well, good that you asked me, you know, uh, that, that these are two part question and good that you asked me so I can respond to you. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the, the number one, uh, first of all about mechanisms, you know, and, and this is very, very good, good question. The, if you look at the across the board from any type of the stimulation, nowadays we have closed loop that we published, we have uh, DTM that we, we are now preparing the manuscript and I help early uh, uh, in, in development of that technology. We have a complex uh, type of stimulation that is coming in, ultra high frequency stimulation that we are just starting a study with a small Taiwanese company. Still lots of things are happening, but none of them has that level of evidence when it comes to uh, basic science when it comes to mechanism of action compared to the to the nevro uh, so they invested the, the the money they they showed the data that clearly explains why would 10 kilohertz provide better pain relief than at least traditional or higher frequency stimulation so they compared low frequency 1000 hertz and they went through the frequencies to 10000 hertz and it seems that you, you can see that change at about upper 6,000 Hertz where recruitment of the dorsal horn is significant and more profound and it's minimal when it comes to traditional spinal cord stimulation. That paper that was published in Neuroscience and it's, uh, and it's available, I mean, I'm sure that uh, never folks can send you a copy of it, clearly shows that the suppression <clears throat> of projecting neurons from lamina one and five that affect wide dynamic range neurons in the dorsal horn is additional effect that definitely distinguishes 10 kilohertz from low frequency and 1000 hertz stimulation. That's number one. Number two, this effect um, is directed toward the wide dynamic range neurons. And wide dynamic range neurons uh, that, that was always holy grail of uh, modulating central sensitization and what we call memory of the pain. Right. And I think that's, that's why 10 kilohertz provides such a better response. I mean, we, at least based on the study that was published in neuroscience, I think that that was nicely substantiated there and compared to other types of the stimulation in an animal model. The second, uh, and, and that was a great point, and I'm responding to this that you just asked me about the other indications. Yes, even with the, this switch off rescues, we, we went to, there was, we, I, I know we switched lots of paddle leads, for example. So the paddle lead was uh, from a neurosurgeon who is a really great guy, and he did a retrograde C12 for atypical facial pain and this was a pentali that was implanted going back down, downwards at C2. Um, it was working for a while. Patient lost the efficacy. And the only thing what I did, I just switched the battery to 10 kilohertz and patient did extremely well. It's still maintaining pain of one or two. The, the other indications, uh, although we, you know, I, I'll answer your question, but I, we can also discuss that outside of this uh, this uh, concept because it the never is uh, supporting this is the off off label indications and uh, I published quite a bit on abdominal pain. We have also a book on comprehensive treatment of abdominal pain. Um, so this, those studies were done 
ID VDFDA for abdominal pain I published with 10 kilohertz clearly showed greater benefit than traditional spinal cord stimulation that we published before, but also um, Jordan Tate published the data on visceral hyperalgesia from pelvic pain. So those are separate group of the patients that respond to superior hypogastric plexus block versus pelvic floor issues. So, um, so there, there will be a number of indications. I think that what impresses me the most is the Nevro is uh, keeping their commitment to be outcomes uh, company. And uh, they invested uh, so much money. This is now number four RCT. And those RCTs, when it comes to spinal cord stimulation are quite expensive. They can be between 15 and $20 million. And, uh, and it's unfortunate that uh, none of the companies before See, we have only two studies from Medtronic. They were funded, and we thank Medtronic for that. They, they, they funded in 2000s related to traditional spinal cord stimulation. And then first time in 2015, we have new waveform, 10 kilohertz. And then suddenly now the whole wave of the randomized perspective studies. Still, we don't have any RCTs from the major players in the field. And, uh, and that's unfortunate. I mean, that's very unfortunate because we do need evidence that benefits all of us, uh, interventional pain physicians, um, in order to get payers interested, in order to get approval for our patients, in order to advance the therapy in the future. 